Today, yes, but what about deposit insurance? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to my latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. A couple of days ago, I did quite a long post on deposit bail and it got quite a lot of response from our viewers. And thank you for your comments. But one of the questions that I got asked a lot was how does bail-in interact with the deposit insurance, which does exist in Australia, but not yet in New Zealand? So today I wanted to explore the deposit insurance conversation a little further. Before I start, I need to make one thing clear. This is my opinion. Um, it'll be based on information that's publicly available, but it's not legal advice, so please don't take it as that. The second point to make is that whilst the bail-in initiatives are designed to deal with a failing bank and perhaps not allowing it to fail simply because you grab deposits and convert it into capital and that means the banks can continue, the deposit insurance scheme only comes into play when a bank has failed. So there's a bit of a double jeopardy here insofar that if a government saw that a bank was likely to fail, they might choose to activate the bail-in strategies before the bank fails, thus avoiding the deposit guarantee, which in Australia certainly they will be liable for. Now, of course, people don't want to talk about that, but the fact is there is definitely a situation where you could see governments pushing for deposit bail-in rather than deposit guarantee. Anyway, let's assume that a bank has failed and that you had money with the bank. So the question is, in the current environment in Australia first, what are the terms and conditions of that deposit guarantee? Who is covered? And how much is covered? And the good news is, there is a lot of information to share on that, all publicly available, and that's what I'm going to do now. To start with, I'm going to look at the ASIC Money Smart website. This is one of the most important sites for consumer finance in Australia, and I think ASIC has done a pretty good job. It's quite difficult to navigate in places, but nevertheless, there's some really good information. It's one of the sites that I recommend almost more than others to people who ask me questions. And if you go down through the site, you can see that there is actually a section on the government guarantee of deposits in Australia. And it says that the Australian government will guarantee deposits up to $250,000 in authorised deposit-taking institutions, ADIs or banks, such as your bank, building society or credit union. And that means they say that this money is guaranteed if anything happens to that bank. But there is a cap. The cap applies per person and per ADI. If you have $250,000, with one ADI and $250,000 with another, your deposits are guaranteed. But if you have more than $250,000 with one ADI, then only up to $250,000 is guaranteed. And they make the point quite rightly that some ADIs operate multiple brands and may offer deposit accounts under more than one brand name. However, they are all part of the same ADI and that means that the guarantee covers deposits per ADI, not per brand name. For example, if you have multiple deposit accounts with brands that are owned by the same ADI, the guarantee will only apply to $250,000 of those funds in total. In the case of joint accounts, each account holder is entitled to an individual guarantee of up to $250,000. And the guarantee applies to all ADIs incorporated in Australia, including Australian owned banks, foreign subsidiary banks, building societies and credit unions. And we'll go through the banks currently on the list in a few moments. And they also go into some detail with regard to the types of accounts covered by the guarantee. Now, again, we'll go into this in more detail. And this includes savings accounts, call accounts, term deposits, current accounts, check accounts, debit card accounts, transaction accounts, personal basic accounts, cash management accounts, farm management deposits, pensioner deeming accounts, mortgage offset accounts, either 100% or partial offset that are separate deposit accounts, trustee accounts and retirement savings accounts. And the last thing they talk about is the seal 
and they say that if you see this seal as represented here on brochures or letters relating to your account you'll know that the account is covered by the guarantee but of course they say this is an example only you may see it in other colors and your financial institution does not have to use or display the seal if it chooses not to display it it doesn't mean your account is not guaranteed so that's a really good starting point to understand how the scheme works in Australia. Now, to give some context to our discussion about depositor protection in Australia, I wanted to refer to the RBA Buddhism from 2011, an article authored by Grant Turner. And this has some very important information contained within it. It's rather old, but nevertheless, it's very pertinent. Now, the first point to make is that whilst there was a temporary $1 million cap post the global financial crisis, in 2012, the limit was set to a permanent basis of $250,000 per person per ADI. Now, this paper says that despite reduction in the cap, it's estimated that the deposit guarantee will still cover around 99% of deposit accounts in full and about 50% of eligible deposits by value. For household deposits, the estimated proportion of the value of balances covered is higher at around 80%. And it goes on to say that the revisions to the scheme is consistent with developments internationally, with a number of other governments having taken the decision to change their deposit insurance limits to a more appropriate post-crisis level. At $250,000 per person per ADI, the revised FCS cap is still at the higher end of the range of post-crisis deposit insurance caps relative to per capita GDP. And here is the table that they published as part of that report. With Australia quite close to the top, it's also worth highlighting the fact that they call out the ex-post and ex-ante. In other words, is there funding before an event or is there a funding only after an event? And in fact, Australia is in a bit of a minority with the ex-post arrangements. And they also discuss the ex-post method of funding FCS payments in contrast to the ex-ante approach, which is more common in other jurisdictions. An ex-ante approach involves charging deposit-taking institutions fees for the provision of the deposit guarantee, with the size of the fee typically determined either as a fixed proportion of an individual's institution's insured deposits or based on the institution's assessed risks of failure. The fees received from insured institutions are usually pulled into a special purpose investment fund from which payments can be made in the event of a failure. In principle, they say, this approach reduces the possibility that surviving institutions or taxpayers are burdened by a shortfall from the liquidation of a failed institution's assets. And the RBA said that while pre-funded schemes remain the most common around the world, a number of countries other than Australia have chosen post-funded arrangements, including Austria, Chile, Luxembourg, Italy, the Netherlands, Slovenia and Switzerland. And that's partly because there is an opportunity cost relating to pre-funding and also the question of runtime to be able to capture sufficient funds into a deposit scheme prior to a bank failing. However, my own perspective is that this is the low-ball route and the government should have activated a process whereby banks are levied ahead of time. But once again, it's the taxpayer who is picking up the tap. Now the quick point is that the Australian scheme operates as a so-called pay box scheme, meaning that its sole purpose is to reimburse depositors in a failed Australian ADI. Some deposit insurance schemes in other jurisdictions have broader mandates, which allow them to finance other bank resolution options, including the creation of a bridge bank and recapitalisation, for example, in Japan and Korea. Although APRA has these broader resolution options available to it, these functions are separate from the FCS. And there's another point to make too. Payments of deposits covered under the FCS are initially financed by the government through a standing appropriation of $20 billion per failed ADI, although they said it is possible that additional funds could be made available if needed, subject to parliamentary approval. The amount paid out under the FCS and the expenses incurred by APRA in connection with the FCS would then be recovered via a priority claim of the government against the assets of the ADI in the liquidation process. 
If the amount realised is insufficient, the government can recover the shortfall through a levy on the ADI industry. And finally, another important aspect of the design of the FCS is that it is administered by APRA. APRA's role as prudential supervisor provides it with the information necessary to determine whether or not the FCS needs to be activated. This approach helps to limit the potential for costly additional monitoring of ADIs that may occur in a separately governed scheme and ensures that there is no coordination problems in the event the FCS is activated. In contrast, deposit insurance schemes in many other countries are separately governed corporations, likely reflecting that the scheme administrators are effectively tasked with managing a special purpose fund, although in some cases regulatory authorities have representatives on the scheme's board. And it's worth highlighting once again that the deposit scheme would need to be activated by the government. APRA essentially does the administration of it. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is to go across to the APRA website because the APRA website has a whole series of pages on the financial claims scheme. And of course, APRA is responsible for the administration of the scheme on behalf of the Australian government. So they say that the financial claims scheme covers bank institutions incorporated in Australia and authorised by APRA that are Australian banks, foreign subsidiary banks, building societies, credit unions and other authorised deposit taking institutions. And we'll go to a full list in a moment. But there are some exceptions. The FCS does not apply to the following branches of foreign banks in Australia, foreign branches of Australian banks located overseas and finance companies and other finance institutions that are not licensed or authorised by APRA. And there is one area of complexity that they cover here. They say some banks, building societies and credit unions may operate multiple banking businesses with different trading names under the same banking licence. However, under the FCS, the deposit protection of $250,000 applies per account holder to deposits under each banking licence, which includes deposits with any other banking business with different trading names that operate under a banking licence. Therefore, if you have deposit accounts with a bank, building side of credit union, and with any other banking business they operate with different trading names, you need to add all these deposits together to calculate the amount that is covered under the FCS for that particular institution. Now, on the same site, we can look at the types of accounts covered under the financial claims scheme. And there's quite a long list here. Savings accounts, call accounts, term accounts, current accounts, check accounts, debit card accounts, transaction accounts, personal basic accounts, cash management accounts, farm management deposit accounts, pension ademia accounts, mortgage offset accounts, either 100% or partial offsets that are separate from deposit accounts and trustee accounts and retirement savings accounts. But they also make it clear that there are some types of accounts that are not covered under the financial claims scheme. The FCS does not apply to the following accounts. Accounts with funds that are not in Australian dollars, accounts kept at foreign branches located overseas of Australian banks, building societies and credit unions, credit balances on credit card facilities or other loans, prepaid card facilities or similar products, and Nostra accounts and Vostra accounts of foreign corporations that carry on banking business or otherwise provide financial services in a foreign country. And they make the point that it is worth checking with your bank or building society or credit union as to whether the particular accounts are covered under the financial claims scheme. So now let's look at the list of authorised deposit taking institutions covered under the financial claims scheme. And again, we must stress it's up to a total value of $250,000. We've covered that now. And usually accounts are offered under the name of the ADI, but some ADIs offer accounts marketed under different names, as we've already discussed. And the list that I'm going to go through now was updated last on the 8th of May 2019. And of course, there is always a chance that new players may be added later or others may be removed. And of course, even APRA warns that they'll keep the list up to date as best they can, but they cannot guarantee that it includes all the names 
that each ADR uses to provide accounts. Let's have a quick flick down through the list of Australian owned authorised deposit institutions. I'm not going to read the long list, you'll be pleased to hear. But you can see there that there are some of the newest players like 86400 Limited, which is one of the new fintechs, AMP Bank, Australia and New Zealand Banking Corporation, ANZ in other words. And then you can go down the list. One interesting one is Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, because under one banking license, they have a whole series of different brands from Adelaide Bank, Bendigo Bank, Circle Alliance Bank, Community Sector Banking, etc., etc. And that's quite important to understand. Another example of that is if you look at CBA, Bank West is under CBA because they are a subsidiary of Commonwealth Bank of Australia. We'll jump down the list just a little bit more. Lots of credit unions, of course. Uh, quite a long list of smaller players. Greater Bank Limited, Heritage Bank Limited. They used to be a credit union, but now are a bank. Go down the list further. Macquarie Bank's there. Members Equity Bank. And then National Australia Bank, it's worth highlighting that U-Bank is a subsidiary of National Australia Bank. Newcastle Permanent, more credit unions. And we can go down the list towards Westpac. And another example here, Westpac Banking Corporation includes Bank of Melbourne, Bank SA, St George Bank. So it's worth just thinking about those subsidiaries that are under a single banking licence. Finally, they also cover the foreign subsidiary banks that are under the scheme. And that includes Arab Bank Australia Limited, Bank of China Australia Limited, Bank of Sydney Limited, Citigroup Proprietary Limited, HSBC Bank Australia Limited, ING Bank Australia Limited, trading as ING, and Rabobank Australia Limited. An important little caveat there at the bottom of the page, that Bank of China Limited Citibank NA and ING Bank NV are branches of foreign banks and are not covered by the financial claims scheme. And just to repeat, ING Bank Australia Limited trading as ING is covered. And the Bank of China Australia Limited is covered. Now one of the things that APRA has on the website is a little journey that you can take to see whether your deposits are protected. And this is meant to be a general guide, but it's actually quite interesting. So let's just start the questions. Do you have deposits with any bank institution covered under the FCS list on the website? I'm going to say yes. And then they basically tell you about the joint accounts and the banking licenses. And the second question is, do you have more than $250,000 with the same bank, Building Society or Credit Union? I'm going to say no to that one. And it concludes that deposit should be protected. And of course, if you selected different answers, then you'd go through a little bit of a different journey. And they make the point about the $250,000 limit. Now, there are also some frequently asked questions, and it's worth going through those because this really starts to get now into the operationalization of the financial claims scheme. And the first comment that you need to be aware of is if the FCS is activated by the Australian government. Now, let's just pause there. This tells you something really, really important. APRA is responsible for the administration of the scheme, but the scheme, if it is to be activated, will be activated by the Australian government. In other words, currently, the scheme, whilst it exists on paper, doesn't exist. And it won't exist for any particular ADI until the government deems that it is required to be activated. Now, that's something which many people don't realise because they sort of assume that it is always there all of the time. No, the scheme will be activated by the government in a crisis when a bank has gone bust, but it doesn't actually exist at the moment. OK, with that out of the way, then it says that if the financial claim scheme is activated by the Australian government, how would payment be made? Well, payments could be by cheque, electronic transfer, or into an account at another financial institution. The next question is, when would payments be made? And they're saying within seven calendar days, perhaps, although sometimes it may take a little longer than that. They mentioned the $250,000 limit again. 
and it says that if the FCS is activated and my only account is with the failed bank, how will I be paid? It's a good question. In the unlikely event that the FCS is activated by the Australian government, you would be able to elect to be either be paid your FCS entitlement in, into an alternative account, details of which you'd provide, or receive a cheque. Payments will only be made in Australian dollars, and electronic payments will only be made to Australian banks, building societies and credit unions. And then the final question is, what is the liquidation process? Well, liquidation is a process where an independent person known as liquidator winds up a company by selling all its assets and paying its debts, or a portion of those debts, where full payment is not possible from the proceeds of the sales. The company's debts are paid in order of priority. When the process has been completed, the company will usually be deregistered and will cease to exist as a legal entity. For example, in the unlikely event that a bank, building society or credit union incorporated in Australia fails and goes into liquidation, any debts are paid out according to priority rules set out in Commonwealth legislation, including the Banking Act. Under the legislation, the proceeds from the sale of a failed bank institution asset will be distributed in the following order. There may be exceptions, but firstly, oh, firstly, to APRA, an amount equal to money paid by APRA to account holders protected under the FCS. So what that says is that deposits that are protected has effectively first rights. Secondly, to APRA for the costs incurred in exercising its powers to administer the FCS. Next, to account holders in banks, building societies, incorporated in Australia, not paid out under the FCS, such as in excess of $250,000 limits. To the RBA, to any debts owed. To parties under an industry support contract certified under the Banking Act for the institution's liabilities. To APRA, for costs of the statutory management of the failed institution. For other liabilities in the order of their priority as set in the Corporations Act. So, the very important message here is this means that in the case of a liquidation of a bank, building society or credit union incorporated in Australia, an account holder making a claim to recover an amount over the FCS limit of $250,000 would rank third in the order of priority listed above. Now that's a very important point because as we said, there is a $250,000 limit and above that, then you rank down the list. So there you are, a bit of a tour around the deposit guarantee processes in Australia. And let me just recap on three things. Firstly, the scheme will only be activated when the government deems it necessary. Second, APRA will take administrative responsibility for the scheme. And third, there are limits on the amount that can be paid out based on the $250,000 ceiling. Now, there's a few other things to take note of. Firstly, there is a $20 billion cap per institution for each FCS scheme. And for some large organisations, you might find that not all deposits, therefore, would be covered. Secondly, there are two types of deposit schemes around the world. There is one type where, essentially, banks are putting money into a kitty ahead of time in case a bank fails. But we don't have that here. What we have is the scheme that I've described to you today. It doesn't exist until the government calls it into existence. There are limits under the scheme. And it's also true that it may well be that if there is a big liability created under the scheme, the government could then come back and knock on the door of other banks later to try and help cover the cost. But it is post the event rather than pre the event. And that is not the recommended way to handle deposit insurance around the world. And the third point, just to reiterate again, this scheme is only in the case of a bank failure when deposits are at risk. It is not something which would be activated prior to a bank failure. The bail-in of deposits could be used prior to a failure to stop a bank failing. Now, having dealt with Australia, let's just cover briefly in New Zealand. And here, the situation is rather different. The Treasury recently published the questions and answers relating to phase two of the review of the Reserve Bank Act in June 2019, in fact. And one of the topics that was covered was the proposed 
reintroduction of a deposit guarantee process in New Zealand. It doesn't exist at the moment. And in fact, they are still consulting on the shape and size of this deposit guarantee. But they're saying that a range of thirty dollars to $50,000 is what they're proposing. And they're saying that that amount would protect around 90% of individual bank deposits in New Zealand, but that would still leave the majority of bank deposit funding at risk. And they think they say that would strike the right balance between protecting small depositors from loss and enhancing public confidence in the banking system on the one hand, while maintaining private incentives to monitor bank risk-taking on the other. Now, of course, we went through this the other day when we went through the scorecards that are now published in New Zealand relating to the banks so that people can understand more about the risks in the system. Now, they're also wrestling with the costs of funding the proposed depositor protection scheme, and there will be some one-up costs and also some ongoing operational costs. And they make the point that modern deposit insurance schemes are normally funded by levies on members' banks, supported where necessarily by temporary lending paid for by taxpayers. If the insurance scheme is accomplished by a deposit of preference, this might also increase banks' non-deposit funding costs as risks are transferred from depositors to institutional investors. And they say that details of the scheme, including costs, have still to be worked out in the next phase of the programme. And there'll also be a fuller cost-benefit to be done. And the final point to say is that they are going through the process of thinking about mandates and powers, governance and decision making, etc, etc. And they're suggesting that the scheme could well be a couple of years away from being implemented. So at the moment, depositors in New Zealand have no deposit insurance scheme at all. And therefore, it's important for individual savers to understand the relative risks of the banks that they may be placing their deposits with. Hence, those scorecards that we discussed previously. So there you are. That's the long and the short of the deposit schemes in Australia and New Zealand. The scheme in Australia is perhaps more generous, although it needs to be activated, and there are some limitations to the way it works. In New Zealand, there is no scheme at the moment. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.